Okay. So thinking back, when did you first come into contact with the whole concept of the Idaho Education Network? <clears throat> My memory is when it was it was first an RS uh, at the legislature, and I know that other members of the legislature had been working on it for a while ahead of that time, trying to develop uh, the vision and, and how the Idaho Education Network would be laid out. And what were your first thoughts? <clears throat> well, I saw a tremendous opportunity, uh, and not just in education. And I guess if we'd made a mistake when we first created the Idaho Education Network, it should have had a broader name uh, mm -hmm. because it, uh, it can be so effective in other areas. But let's talk about education first because I think that's uh, obviously where it was directed initially. Um, in, in, in rural school districts, it was going to offer the, uh, uh, the additional classes that were not available there uh, to help us satisfy our, our constitutional requirement to provide uniform public education. Uh, in, uh, in, in urban districts, it, it gave an opportunity for students to, uh, to schedule uh, classes around uh, other activities that they had interests or concerns in. Uh, so uh, from, from, from that standpoint, it was going to provide uh, 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 greater opportunity for them as well. Uh, <coughs> and uh, uh, obviously anything that, uh, 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 that brings uh, uh, broadband to local communities uh, will be an enhancement to economic development. Uh, and the other parts that we looked at in the legislation that was drafted in, in the enabling legislation were, were telemedicine, I think it said telehealth, um, and state agencies and libraries. So there's a part of that that we've not ever had the opportunity to get to. We've only gotten to phase one of the education part. Uh, phase two was supposed to be elementary and middle schools. And that was when the money ran out. Thinking back to 2008 and that session, can you walk us through the process and your involvement at that time as much as you can remember? Well, I don't know that, uh, <clears throat> that there was anything that I did specifically other than make sure that the, uh, the, the bill got through uh, the Senate Education Committee. I'm guessing that I spoke to it on the floor, but I don't know that I even did that. As you saw it starting to take shape, were you comfortable with how it was rolling out in that first phase? Um, and I guess maybe that's where there's a little disconnect. Uh, the legislature passes a bill, but they don't manage how uh, something like the Idaho Education Network is set up past that point. Uh, and it's my understanding that there were some some uh, uh, tech people that got together and, and created a structure uh, that they felt was uh, the best for the state of Idaho. And, uh, and looking back on that, uh, I, I think the proof's in the pudding. There are states that are using our model as a, a basis to establish their own, their own uh, networks. And, um, and we won a, 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 an award, a national award, uh, for the network. As a lawmaker, looking at how it was affecting schools in your area, how did you feel? Well, again, uh, uh, the school district that I represent, Coeur d'Alene School District, they had access to uh, broadband before the Idaho Education Network. Um, they have not used the, the VTC equipment uh, as effectively as it has been used in other areas. Uh, so I don't think it had as much impact on, uh, uh, on the Coeur d'Alene School District as it, would have, it, as it had on other areas of the state, except for the fact that it did free up some general fund money from their standpoint uh, because the state was paying for the service and was taking care of the E-rate part of it as well. So as the Senate Education Committee Chairman then, 
seeing how it affected classrooms in other parts of the state, how did you feel when you started seeing that implemented? Well, I felt, I felt good about it. Uh, uh, hearing stories of, of, of kids uh, uh, sitting in the classroom in, in a biology class and, and speaking with, a, with somebody that's underwater in the Great Barrier Reef. Uh, without internet access, they wouldn't have had those opportunities. Um, and uh, and be able to participate uh, uh, cooperatively in, in, in regions uh, among schools, uh, sharing teachers, which really saved teachers' jobs in some cases, uh, and, and certainly provided a, a, a what I would consider a, a, a great alternative to asynchronous classes because a teacher was, was involved live. Uh, you know, that, that's good stuff. That, at the time, was cutting art stuff. One of the things we've been looking into is the distance learning and how this enables students in, say, DECLO to take an AP Calculus class. At the same time, there, there hasn't been any data collected or at least aggregated and collated as to whether they're retaining the information at the same level as students who are taking it in person. Did that ever come up in conversations? And if not, should it have come up? And I don't remember that it ever came up in conversations. Uh, certainly when you, down, you start down that road, there's, there's not a whole lot of data available, at least Idaho data, uh, to make that comparison. I don't know if anyone has to this point. Uh, I believe there's data available that compare uh, um, success in the synchronous versus asynchronous world. And, and I believe that the, the synchronous uh, class participation is, is better, that, that more students complete uh, where they actually have access to a live teacher. Got it. I'm kind of moving forward a little bit. When did you first hear that there were troubles with IEN in the contract? Uh, I don't know that I was aware of it before uh, uh, legal action was initiated. I don't have memory of it before that time. Did you hear rumors of the pending legal action before a case or a complaint was actually filed? I have no memory of that. I could have. I don't remember. And should this have ended up in court? <clears throat> well, there are a lot of things in this world that shouldn't end up in court. Um, <clears throat> and it appears based on uh, the, the decisions of, of the court, and depending on which court you, uh, you look to, that there was uh, at least one legitimate uh, concern. Um, <clears throat> and, and, and you know, hindsight's twenty twenty. Uh, not necessarily the same uh, looking forward. Uh, and I heard the governor say, you know, if, if he'd had his choice, there would have been legal enforceable contracts at the start. Um, and it's regrettable that it didn't happen the way it should have. Looking back, is there anything that you personally would have done differently? Not that I can think of. Um, uh, certainly not as a member of the legislature other than, I mean, we got reports. Uh, I sat on IPRAC for a while, and there were reports there, too. Um, and, um, and I don't know that there was anything wrong with, with the network except for the, the, the problem with the procurement. Uh, because I believe it's being used effectively. It's used, being used differently in, in areas uh, and in districts, uh, one from another. But overall, it's all being used effectively. And now this is the part where you're really going to have fun. So looking forward, what's the solution? 
<clears throat> the short-term solution is still cloudy. Uh, I believe that there is a very, very good opportunity for a long-term solution. The Department of Administration has a, a, an RFI, a request for information on the street. Actually, it closed on Sunday. Uh, they got a number of responses. Uh, they're going to impanel a group of evaluators that will develop an RFP. Um, it will be put to, uh, to the vendors and um, we could have a contract for a long-term solution in place by the end of August. Um, it will not be E-rate eligible for this year, but uh, it has the opportunity to be something totally different than, than what the IEN is right now. Um, the technology that we're using is, is six years old. Uh, there could be something else that will be incorporated in a future IEN uh, that will make it even better. <coughs> um, Structure-wise, as far as contracts go, there's, there's opportunities to, to re reset those, those contracts uh, uh, that, uh, uh, that might, might make it better for the state, might, might make providers be more competitive. Uh, but when we start down that road, we also then have to look at the implications for E-rate. Uh, the state of Utah has kind of a different setup. Uh, and because the top layer, uh, the administrative layer, is, is managed by the state, it's not E-rate fundable. Uh, but they feel that that, that expenditure uh, is worth the economies they get as they move farther down. Uh, the, the, the food chain. So who knows where it's going to go, but I think, I think it's got a bright future. Uh, I, I love to talk to Jeff Sayer from the Department of Commerce because he's got this vision for the state of Idaho uh, being the first state in the union that provides a gigabyte of, of, of broadband to every community. And there's potential for that. And had not the IEN started down this road, and had not local school districts been anchor tenants, I don't think we'd have seen the progress we've had so far. We don't have a gigabyte mm -hmm. available in very many communities, but when we started the IEN, there were only 17 school districts that had fiber. Now there are 115. And, and that's part of, uh, partly because of the catalyst that the anchor tenant school districts provided. Considering the problems that have resulted from the initial contract. Why should the people of Idaho trust that this short-term solution is going to work out? <clears throat> the short-term solution uh, would be an, an emergency contract situation. Um, that's clearly within the law in the state of Idaho. Uh, there's some concern about how the federal government would feel about a short-term solution, but when E-rate dollars are not uh, a part of the mix, there really isn't a concern about what the feds uh, think about it. We just need to be sure that our, our uh, procurement procedures are, are uh, in place and, and being followed. Um, <clears throat> the first contract that was let, um, if, if it had not been amended, if it had just simply been a purchase order, one document different, uh, at least as I understand it, we would have been within the law. When, when individual school districts are scrambling to meet this deadline by the end of February, is there concern within the administration or any of the uh, departments about whether or not they're going to run into similar troubles with them submitting the wrong document or the, them running into hiccups and ending up in court individually? <clears throat> well, I guess that could always happen. In the, the language that we saw at the Joint Committee yesterday, <clears throat> there was a, a notwithstanding language to relax the purchasing requirements uh, for local school districts. And I understand that uh, that, that language wasn't, uh, wasn't perfect and there may have to be um, a, 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 new, uh, a new draft moved forward. 
there's always concern uh, as you uh, move down the scale of things that there won't be the expertise available to know what to do. Uh, the State Department of Education has two people, uh, one being their IT director and another person assigned specifically to E-Rate Consulting um, that uh, um, are actively trying to help districts. I understand they're, start, they're starting daily podcasts no, webinars, uh, to, uh, to see if they can address the issues. Um, the other piece of it is, if it comes to that, all the equipment need, will need to be reprogrammed. Uh, new IP addresses, uh, new routers, um, and whether local districts have the uh, staff with the technical ability to, to make those transitions is another question. Uh, the Department of Administration is looking at uh, um, how they might be able to assist using their IT help desk personnel, uh, local districts with that concern. And their plan is to start on the districts that are using the BCT equipment because they're the most critical uh, to, uh, to keep up and running. Does the department know yet, or the administration know yet, if there are any students in real danger of not graduating if they don't complete an IEN class? And if so, has there been any discussion about relaxing graduation requirements in this special situation? To my knowledge, there's been no discussion of relaxing graduation requirements. Uh, it is my understanding that there are a number of students um, taking both IEN classes and IDLA classes that are at risk. Uh, it depends on how long the internet is down in those districts as to how much at risk they are. Going back to the legal side of things, what can you tell us about the Department of Justice investigation? <clears throat> um, I can't tell you a whole lot. Uh, DOJ is looking at, uh, uh, at, at E-rate. Uh, whether, whether we appropriately collected E-rate. <coughs> uh, um, it's my understanding that they were supposed to have done something within 60 days of the start of the investigation, and it's been 14 months. Uh, I'm not sure what that means. Uh, it could mean that they haven't found what they, they need to proceed. Um, I don't know. So you don't know if it's an ongoing investigation or it quietly stopped? Well, I believe it, if, it would, if it would have quietly stopped, we would have known. But I don't know that for a fact either. That's, that's more a question for uh, an attorney or the attorney general's office. Moving forward, it sounds like a lot of people have ideas to cobble this back together, but there are also a lot of superintendents and teachers and parents and students across the state who have been affected by this. Are you concerned that you won't be able to win back the trust? That's always an issue. <clears throat> and let's just take it from the teacher's perspective who has prepared a lesson plan that incorporates going to the Great Barrier Reef. And when she turns on the equipment, nothing happens. What confidence does she have the next time she plans a, a lesson plan that that access will be available? That's my biggest concern uh, about maintaining the viability of the network. Um, you can see uh, from enrollment numbers uh, when <clears throat> when we had a requirement that uh, uh, that every every teacher or student graduate with a, a exposure to a, a an online class, the enrollment was up considerably. Uh, when when that rule got uh, uh, put on hold by the State Board of Education, uh, enrollment has dropped. And I guess that says something to the requirement. Uh, but you look at what's what's happened with uh, uh, IDLA classes and and. They seem to continue to be popular. Uh, 
And again, it, it gives flexibility to students, particularly if they've got internet access at home, to, uh, to do things on their own time, to, prog to progress at their own speed. Uh, and I think that's an important part of this whole thing. Uh, you know, we, we haven't heard a whole lot lately about senior slump, but that's always been an issue. I remember as a senior goofing off uh, and, and providing students with, with dual credit opportunities and with, uh, with, with room to adjust their schedules uh, to their own liking. That's extremely important. Is this right now the worst case scenario or do you think it could be worse? Well, I sincerely hope that it doesn't get any worse than it is right now. <clears throat> I hope we can track a path forward that gives uh, parents, teachers, school districts confidence uh, and, uh, um, and will inspire other opportunities to join the network. I met today with Health and Welfare, who's got a grant for telemedicine, who's looking at a way to co connect critical care hospitals across the state and clinics. And we have the ability to do that if we can put this back together. This was one of the hallmarks of education from your committee and the House Education Committee in 2008. How mad are you right now? I'm not mad, I'm disappointed. <clears throat> and I'm committed to find a path forward that con continues to give this opportunity to Idaho kids. Is there anything else you want to add? I think I'm good. Are you sure? I'm positive. <laughs>